Hello, how are you? Greetings from afar. I hope you're doing great. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to our program, to our 50th program. On behalf of the Pan Badminton Pan American Confederation, we give you the warmest welcome to our Coach Corner program. It's fourth season. My name is Darian Gomez, and I will be your moderator today's session from San Jose in Costa Rica. Today we have the pleasure of having one of the most emblematic badminton coaches in the continent. I'm talking about Dr. Alberto Garrido from the city of Mexico, who will talk about a topic of great interest today, control, evaluation and training of strength in badminton. Before leaving you with our guest, I'd like to read a short summary of our guest's career in badminton. Alberto has a, has a degree in exercise sciences from the Autonomous University of Nuevo León in Mexico. He has a master's degree and a PhD from the Pablo de Olavide University of Sevilla in Spain. Currently, he is a professor at the Autonomous University of Nuevo León. Without further ado, let's welcome our guest. Good afternoon, Alberto. Welcome to our program. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for the introduction, Adrián. I would like to thank Badminton Panam for the invite as well. Go ahead. Welcome. Thank you very much. Well, welcome everyone. What I'm going to do now is share my screen. And as Adrian mentioned, if you have any questions, write them down in the chat box so at the end I can try to answer them. So I'm going to share my screen in order to get started. Just give me a minute and we'll go ahead. Very good, well, the topic today is, in my opinion, one of the most in important topics in badminton, but also in training in general, in any sport, which is control, evaluation, and training of strength in badminton. We know that strength is the physical ability, but sometimes some coaches we don't do this as we are supposed to. And it's this is a fundamental skill for anyone who's in sports. If we want to move faster, then we need to train strength. What we're we going to talk about now is the type of exercises and evaluations and controls we can do with badminton athletes. I'm going to give you some examples so you can also observe and uh, learn a little bit more about this. And the idea of all of this is for you to apply these in your trainings, regardless of the country or city where you are, you can do this. And if you do this, you will feel more certain of the fact that your uh, strength training is on track. So on this slide, you can see the objectives of strength. I'm just going to mention them just as they are on the screen. The first item says to control the training process and changes in performance. One of the things that's going to help us to control strength or evaluate it actually is to see the process of training. If I am stuck or if I'm making progress or not. So this is one of the items that we need in order to control the this process. The second thing is to define the needs of strength and power. And I want to explain why. One of the problems that we have when we work on strength, and when I talk about strength, I'm talking about additional weights. For example, weights or well, however you call them in your country. We have to see the load that my athlete has. And that's a very important issue, the weight. For example, if I am doing squats, how much weight do I need in order to improve? It's not just about increasing weight just for the uh, sake of doing it. Because 
Many times we think that weightlifting is going to be good and we're, go we're going to get better. No, but we can also damage, we can also injure our, our athletes. So we have to think about maximum load and well, we have to see different definitions here. And then we, the third item is to define the profile of the athlete. The fourth item is very important and we're all interested in this, which is to prescribe the most appropriate training. And we need to customize training. We all know this, this is really important. Customizing training in terms of strength means that each individual has its own load. And one of the problems that we have, well, there are different types of problems. We've discovered many problems actually, but sometimes if we have a group of badminton athletes, sometimes we give the exact same weight to all of them. But maybe this weight can be ideal for one athlete, but maybe a uh, too heavy of a weight for another athlete or a very low weight for another one. The fifth one is to see the difference between athletes of the same or different levels. When we talk about the high performance, we actually think about who has the actual strength to move fast, who doesn't have this, and then we can start making decisions. We have to think, okay, which Athletes can go to high um, performance, who cannot, who doesn't really have that ability or skill. High performance in badminton and in most sports for that matter. Well, this might sound kind of weird, but we need to discriminate. But actually, high performance only includes very, very few. So we have to actually discriminate who has that ability to go to high performance. And the last item that I think can help most of us is to contribute to talent identification. The um, assessing or evaluating strength can help us to identify who might be talents for a specific uh, sport, in our case, badminton. So these are the objectives of strength. These are just some of them, the most important ones that I think in the case of badminton. Now, all of us who work uh, with training know the methods that are used the most to program strength training. One is maximum repetition. I'm pretty sure most of you know about this. Maximum repetition is, for example, in the case of squats, we, weigh, we lift the most weight we can and this would be the maximum repetition. Now this method is the one that is used the most to do to do this exercise but my recommendation for all of you is to do this maximum repetition method. Um, I mean I would advise you to try to stop doing it. Why? Because there are some problems with this maximum repetition method. The first one is that there can always be the possibility for an injury. That's why we have to avoid it, or one of the reasons why we have to avoid doing maximum repetition. The second problem is the stress in the individual. We know that this creates a lot of stress. I once... Um, followed this method, but we know uh, that, and that's why I know that it's very stressful. The third thing is that we don't know the strength peak. The goal of strength is not to lift more and more weight, because we're not uh, lift weight, uh, we don't actually uh, do this as a sport, but we want to reach higher peaks of strength and power. That's what I'm interested in, in this sport. So we have to see how we can localize this. So I can assign a specific load to my athlete depending on the exercise he's performing. And the last item states that we don't actually know the actual uh, intensities. When we talk about maximum repetition, the only thing that we know is a maximum weight. And we can say that this is 100% of intensity, but what's the problem? 99% 
we don't know 99% of, of a person. We don't know how, how much power, how much strength peak uh, are created with 50% of the maximum load. So I don't really know this. And what I'm interested in uh, is um, the ideal load with athlete, with badminton athletes. That's what I'm interested in because they don't do weightlifting as a sport. So we have to actually uh, have this clear. In developed countries, Bad min, uh, maximum repetition has pretty much been forgotten because there are other methods like the ones I'm going to show you later on so you can uh, learn about them. This is a very short talk, but with this you can uh, get some information and then look uh, look it up even more later on. So these are the most um, used methods. But in the next slide, I'm going to show you another method, one of the best proven methods uh, of maximum uh, repetition with additional weights. The methods that we use here in badminton in Nuevo León, well, one of the methods that we use is the speed of execution, just so we're clear. In the same context of the squat that we are all thinking about, well, we um, try to go down when doing the squat we do it in a control way, but when we want to stand up, we would have to execute this at as fast as we can. That's why the method is called execution speed or speed of execution. So we need to execute the first stage as fast as possible. And I'm going to tell you why now. It's not just because I say so. It's This has actually been proven scientifically. So the first thing that you can see there is that the ideal component for in order to calculate the intensity of strength training is the execution. Then we know the generated power. The third one is that we know the execution speed. And finally, we know the actual intensities. So if we do a squat with whatever percentage that you want, whatever you have in mind, and you don't execute this at the maximum speed possible, then you're never going to have a strength peak or a power peak. So you're going to say, well, I want to do this uh, slow. I don't want to do it fast because, well, I don't care. It's the same to me. But in terms of sports, there is a goal. What's that? If I move that load as fast as possible, then I'm going to get a very high power. And what I'm interested in, in an um, athlete, is to create a lot of power. Because when you t bring this to the court, he, will be, or he or she will be able to move really fast. So if I do a movement slowly or not so fast, when you transfer this to the sport itself, in this case, it would be badminton, I mean, in the, to the court, if I want to ask my athlete to move fast in the court, he won't do it because I trained him in, at a very low speed. But if I train him with a maximum uh, execution speed, then in the court, you will notice this execution speed. So all of this makes sense. If I train in a specific way, you will uh, execute it in a specific way as well in the court. So you need to execute as fast as possible the exercises that we're doing with additional loads or weights. And the other thing is that if we want to improve our athlete's speed in court, then the only way, the only proven way to do so is by working with strength. That's the only way to do so. And that's to do it with additional weights. The problem is that sometimes we don't find the ideal loads. And that's the problem that we found. Very well. I'm going to move on to the next slide now. So this idea can get a little bit more clear. The speed of execution, which is the these are the well the training loads with additional weights are determined through the speed of execution now what type of exercises do we need to do we ha can have extra we have to use additional or extra weights but 
it would be ideal to use free weights. Now, why free weights? Like squats or uh, different or press benches or... Why are these more beneficial than more localized exercises such as the ones that we know as biceps, triceps, exercises, or quadriceps extension? Where we actually move just one muscle group. So the free exercises will be better for these strength tra transfer. Why? Because while well, we train in badminton, is move, movements. So we need to train similar exercises as in badminton. That's why squats are exercises that move most of the muscle groups. Many of you will tell us, well, but they are dangerous. They are not dangerous as, as long as you train using the technique. So it has been proven that there are more injuries in the court when doing gymnastics. So we should not be afraid of this. We have to... Um, consider another advantage of these free weights. The power and strength generation is a lot higher than in localized exercises. Just to give you an example, when you extend, when you bend and, and, and stretch a, a bicep or quadricep, sorry, you just have a specific amount of power. But in a squat, you're going to move the abdomen and the lower limbs, but you can get up to 800 watts, which is four times more in terms of power. That's why these free weights bring more benefits to the athlete. It has been, com com it has been proven that uh, these are better than localized exercises. And now let's see uh, something more graphic. The equipment that we can use in order to measure the uh, speed of execution are the following. These are the ones that you can see on the screen. The one on the left, the white one, can be placed in the bar. You can do the concentric phase and this sensor will measure the, the speed of execution per second and the power generation as well. So this blue one, the third one that you see here, is another one. And at the end, you can see an accelerometer. Obviously, these have a price, but that's justified because we are going to have a good benefit in the, with the athletes. Now, there are different applications. There are apps that are very low cost and you can use these with your athletes. For example, the fourth one over here, where you see a bicep, this is called My Lift. It's uh, available for Android, and I think that it costs 10 or $15 to download it. It's quite cheap. And you can do what you are going to see later on. You're going to be able to localize the ideal weights for each athlete so you can customize the training so that would be one of the advantages of this app it you can download it it's uh, available for android and ios now how can you execute all of this i have some videos here from some athletes badminton athletes with the echo linear device and you can see here the execution in order to evaluate and control the exercises and this is how you're supposed to train uh strength if you don't if you didn't know about this you can start executing these you have to do these exercises as fast as possible because sports are not played slowly. They always, they're always played at maximum speed. That's why it's important to practice this outside of the court as well. Here you can see this athlete doing a squat and you can see that when she descends, it's slow, but when she uh, stands up, she does it faster. With this software, we can see the speed in which she executed the squad with this weight and the power generation with that weight that she has. 
that's a maximum power possible and you can see it in the program now just so it's clear this over here in the execution what you have to notice is that we can use it, this for control ev and evaluation but also when training if we have enough systems we can train with the systems because it will they will help us to control the the athlete's fatigue remember that strength training also helps us to uh, observe this fatigue let's check out the second video here we have a, a roman dead weight we can see the speed here and let's watch the third video many of you might say why is he jumping when he jumps yeah of course people some people can jump some others cannot but when we jump we can create more uh, a greater speed and power so this will uh, benefit us when we go to the court so this is part of the execution i know that uh, i'm going uh, um, quite fast i cannot explain more in depth but what i wanted to tell you is that the evaluation control and training if we use a sensor such as this one we are going to control the speed that they have while executing the exercise when we observe that within a series the athlete tends to decrease its speed then we have to stop the series we have to do this as precise as possible because there's always a margin of error we have to observe that when the speed de starts to decrease and we have to stop the series why because then the athlete is not creating those power peaks that i want those strength peaks that i want so it's not necessary to continue anymore because if i continue with this high fatigue when the uh, speed is starting to decrease then you can get to hypertrophy because Many times we think that if we work on strength, then we're going to just uh, have hypertrophy. We're going uh, to increase the muscle, but no, we're working on neuromuscles. That's a neuromuscle work. That's why we're sending the, send, uh, the messages straight to the muscle in order to execute this movement. So when we train with these type of sensors and the uh, speed starts to descend, then we have to stop the series because then it's going to be counterproductive in badminton i don't want an athlete that is extremely um that has a big muscles no of course i want uh, athletes that um that have good muscles but that can move fast these are some other videos from other athletes this is the bench press um it's similar it's the same you have to do it as fast as possible when it's going up. So you can see that you can execute this with different exercises. And if you realize this, you can see that you're moving most of the muscle groups. Check out this other athlete. This is a start phase. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. So she's. you can see the sensor there. It's on. And here you can see another badminton player doing a squat. And I wanted to stop here. Badminton athletes. What we do with badminton athletes here in Nueva León is, well, when they uh, use additional weights, they use the um, shoes that are ideal for weightlifting. And these shoes are um, important as well because then they will have they will generate more uh, strength and power. And they can they will last a long time because you will only use them in the gym at the gym so badminton athletes should use these should wear these uh, specific sneakers the same there's a sensor there so we're analyzing the speed of execution now many of you might uh, think that this there's a that this is a lot of weight well i cannot tell you if it's uh, so or not we have to study this so i'm going to show you some data from the videos that you're watching so you can know it these are two other athletes you can see how they execute the exercise 
she is uh, 16 years old and she's been working uh, at the gym for three or four years. It, does, it doesn't matter if they are very young, as long as we give them the ideal load. That's what's most important. Here we're working on strength. This is genetic isometric work where a lot of speed is being created and then this speed comes back. Okay, this is a conic poly that we use in order to work on strength. This is the last, the last slide before we go to break. So this is optimal load. Everything I just mentioned uh, was related to getting an ideal load, which is an optimal load. And every athlete has an optimal load. What's this? What do we mean by this? This is the minimum stimulus in terms of quality, organization, and volu volume and intensity that can give us the highest results. And we have to uh, be careful because many times we think about minimum stimulus and we don't mean insignificant by this. It means that with that minimum, I can get the high, the best results. The second item says that the minimum load, the minimum training load, does not mean that this is an insignificant load in size, but that it's the most optimal for uh, a good level of results. And the third one says that the what's essential in sports training is to find the optimal load parameters because each athlete will have its own. Uh, weight and its own volume. I mean, with that, I mean number of repetitions. And we have to find this. If we don't find this, then we might be in trouble because we can have over we can have overtraining or undertrain them. These are some images where you can see, for example, the bars to measure the jump and the strength or the height of the jump, the linear coder in order to see the speed of these um, exercise while, while, being, while being executed. These are the devices that you can use in badminton. So we were here talking about this linear coder, this device over here. Remember that this just measures speed while standing up and the power that we generate with whatever weight that you want. Okay, so here, this is the sp speed of execution. Let me explain to you. This is a badminton athlete. We include four different weights. And what we do is to avoid doing the maximum repetition. We avoid the maximum repetition and we do this test. How do we do it with four weights? In the table, you can see 30 kilograms, 47 kilograms, 65 kilograms. So what we do with our athlete is we ask her to execute one or two repetitions, but do it slowly. These are not continuous repetitions. For example, with 20 kilograms, remember that this is a medium speed, but this creates 283 watts. And you can see that it creates less speed here because there's more weight, but check out the power generation is a bit higher. So with 47 kilos, we have 1.06 speed and 490 in terms of power. With 65 kilos, 0.78 speed and 498 watts. So in based of these four loads or weights, we find a load with these power peaks, maximum power peaks. In this graph at the left you can see two red dots and this is the power the first one is 490 and the second one is 498 this graph 
is the speed power curve. Now, the, each blue dot is the speed that you see over here in this chart. But you can see it in relation to the load. And the red ones are the power. So between 47 and 65 kilos, we can get these maximum power peaks. So when I train with my athlete, especially with these athletes, I will have to give her weights of 40, between 47 and 65 kilos because I know that that's when she creates the most power. So when we transfer this to the court, the court, she will move a lot faster. This is the exact same graph you can see. You, you saw there, so this is the badminton player doing squats. So there are systems that automatically tell you the maximum, the, the weight for each maximum power, for example. With 58.7 kilograms, this athlete creates 513 watts of peak power. So I know that in her case, when never doing squats, I will give her a weight that will be between 47 and 65 kilos. Now, be careful. I give her weight, weights that are within that range, but... Also, I give her a little bit more so she can adapt to the to higher loads when she does exercise later on again. With this 58.7 kilos, she currently creates 513 watts. But after three or four uh, weeks, she will adapt to this load. So instead of creating just 513 watts, I want her to create maybe 550 watts. So that's when... I will notice that she is actually improving with this strength exercise. But if, um, it, but if the situation is reversed, then I will realize that this is not working. That the work that you are doing for physical preparation is actually not working. So let's look at this badminton player. Check out the optimal load of these athlete it's 78.9 kilos that's when he creates 787 watts at a speed of at an optimal speed of 1.01 so he would have to a way to lift between 78 and 80 kilos so i have to give him uh, loads that are a bit higher so he can improve and that's what we do pretty much this is the information that we create and with this information I can do my training plan in terms of working on strength and this would be adapted to the athlete but there would always be a margin of error of course but this would be quite uh, small. So we pretty much are avoiding the maximum repetition method. In Juan José González Padillo's uh, book, this is a person that focuses uh, his work only on strength generation and, and its evaluation. This table is generic. This squat information over here shows the speed when the maximum power is reached if we had a sensor, which would be 0.76 and what would happen if I didn't have a sensor? Here it says that approximately with 65% of one uh, RM, you will reach the maximum power peak in that squat. And that's quite important. You can use that already. And here, this 0.31 means the maximum repetition without actually doing it. What do I mean? So you don't get uh, too confused. This 0.31 means, for example, there's a person that I don't know and I give her 60 kilos. So whenever standing up, I, I know that she will be very close to her 
maximum level because this is where she reached her maximum repetition. That's what RM stands for, maximum repetition. So here we're going to avoid her doing a maximum repetition because I will have to stop uh, this athlete before she reaches this level. So you can use this chart with any um, athlete because you can see here the starting, the sudden dash, the strength load, the squat and everything. Well, we are running out of time, so let's move on. This is the MyLift app. You can download it. And this is how you use it. You have to include four different weights, measure the speed while the athlete is standing up in a squat, and the app will put this information in a graph. At the end of the fourth, fourth load or weight, the app will give you the estimated maximum repetition. Now, you have to avoid doing this test, but you can use the percent percentages of, max of estimated maximum repetition. For example, if you have four weights that don't reach the maximum point, but the, where the athlete can work, so the app will give you the estimated maximum repetition so you could work with maximum repetition percentages but remember something that's really important the maximum repetition every day will changes a lot it has been proven that it can change between 1 to 15 percent per day because it depends a lot on how fatigued the person is so if you do this test in a squat every time a squat is done in a training session you, with one single recording with any of these four weights, you can record it and measure it and the system will calculate the maximum repetition, the estimated maximum repetition of that day alone. Okay, let's not get confused here. So one, right now it says 117.3. But after two days, let's say that I'm going to do squats again. So I'll do the test again with one uh, weight and one repetition. So the system will distribute this again and will show you another maximum repetition. Now it, it might be 130, let's say. So if in my training plan I said that today I'm going to do 60% of maximum repetition in the squat training, then I have to calculate this based on the maximum repetition of that day, but but without actually doing it. So we're just estimating this. So this is how we can work. And I think that this is the best way to work in order to avoid uh, injuries or fatigue in athletes. Let's move forward because it, we need to, to finish the talk. Uh, in order to have a Q&A. So here in this graph, you can see the maximum repetition that can be reached with different weights. For example, the bench press is reached with a different level in, case, uh, in comparison to the squad or another exercise. So each exercise is different. It's very particular. So if we have an accel accelerometer or a sensor and if we can measure the speed, we can actually know the load or the intensity of the maximum repetition or the intensity of the exercise. Imagine if you just give 60 kilos to a person that you don't know and this person will do the repetitions and will create one meters per second in the squad. But here, I know that this will be equivalent to the 60% of the maximum repetition with 60 kilos. But imagine that you are training 60 kilos in, and the person does this one meter per second for a while. But after a while, I want this person to move this load faster. But after three weeks, let's say that these 60 kilos, instead of moving uh, it in a, a meter per second, it's... It's been done in less. Okay, so then this uh, amount is not 60% anymore, but just 55% of the maximum repetition. So when we program the strength training, we can be wrong when we do a training because maybe the weight doesn't is not equivalent to the load that I wanted. Maybe it is equivalent to a different percentage that can be lower or higher. So this topic is quite uh, broad, but I just wanted to give you this informal talk to tell you that this exists and is one of the best methods that exist 
for strength training in athletes. So now you know this information. There is the uh, speed execution training in order to evaluate, control, and train strength. We, you can use sophisticated um, devices, but you can also have very inexpensive apps that you can download. And this was um, strength training. And I just wanted to show you this. This is the follow-up in a badminton player. For example, here you can see it says uh, January 30th, 2019 and March 19th, 2019. And this is the follow-up or, or we're monitoring the squats in an athlete. So the system helped us and you can see that after five or six weeks, the peak power increased from 787.5 to 843.7. So there is an increase of 7.13%. And its optimal load improved from 78.9 to 84.8. So this is an objective measurement in order to be certain and know that we are on track. This is some data from other athletes. Here you can see June 3rd, 2019, there was 413 watts uh, in a squat. Uh, on August 12, 2019, she, he generated 696.6 watts. And then by March 10th, it was 730 watts. And here you can see the increase in percentages and the optimal loads. There's a, a girl here you can see that there was an improvement of 11%. So with only small changes, you can see that these uh, athletes used to do just weightlifting just because they had to do it and that's it. But then we changed the optimal, we changed the exercises depending on the optimal load and we saw these drastic uh, changes with this method. Now the idea of working, idea of working with uh, this is that if we work on strength, we can see results in court. So the athlete can actually move uh, faster to hit the shuttle stronger. So the idea is to make an, a badminton athlete as fast as he can be in the court. Uh, one of the few ways to do so is with additional weights and optimal loads. And we shouldn't be afraid of uh, these additional weights. If we are afraid of them, then we are going to be in disadvantage in comparison to other athletes. And the idea is to move faster, make smashes. Well, that's the idea of badminton. And these are just some videos of badminton players who are following this method. And well, in their opinion, they have improved uh, their mobility quite a lot, their speed as well, but that's their opinion. If we actually measure this and we prove it, then we can say that their opinion plus the data that we have from the different devices, it seems that it's true. So that's the idea. So it's not, we don't want to have big muscles or have hypertrophy, but just to have faster athletes. I know that we skipped some slides, but I didn't want to speak more than the time that I was allocated, but well, we could do this in six months if we wanted. Very well, thank you very much, Alberto. So now we will move on to our Q&A section. We just have five minutes to answer as much as many questions as possible. It, that talk has been quite interesting and some people asked about the weight that you mentioned. This is just external weight or is it the weight of the bar plus discs? That's a very good question because many times the training programs that are sent uh, don't consider this. They think about 50 kilos besides the bar, but no, we're including the bar. 50 kilos means the Olympic bar plus discs. I mean, the, it's a total weight of all of it. 
according to your experience, Alberto. If you work with external weights, you have to do this or you can start working on this at what age? That's always a very good question. Remember that there are some sensitive um, stages or phases. For example, in girls, these start this can be started at 10 years old and in boys a little bit later. The development of children is different. So in girls, you can start with 10, 11 year olds. There's no problem. And in the case of boys, it, once they are 11 or 12 years old, it's fine. As long as we give them the appropriate loads, because if not, you can actually injure, injure them. You, now, there are some athletes that want to keep working on these or or start working on these when they are 15, 16 years old. But the problem is that maybe the time has passed. The sensitive time has passed. That's why sometimes we see in certain sports that there are big differences between athletes who are 15, 16 years old from one country to another. And that's because they started in their sensitive training phases in comparison to others. So there's no problem. You can start at 10, 11 years old when you have uh, girls or 11 or 12 when they are boys with additional weights. It's better to work like that instead of just their own weight. Because if you have a kid that is that weighs 50 kilos, then you can give him, for example, a 10 or 12 kilo bar and he can work with that. So... You shouldn't make any mistakes in that sense, but you can uh, work with those ages as long as you have you give them the ideal weights and evaluate them and control it. Alberto, do you recommend any work to do prior this? Prior working on speed and strength. If we are going to do physical preparation with additional weights, the idea is to execute the, the same movement without uh, any weights, uh, just to warm up, to prepare the body for that exercise. Now, one of the things that we are doing a lot as well is that during the tournaments, before starting a training session to play, you can have a short strength training session and I'm talking about a very short session, just to give you an example, two series of squats and maybe two series of jumps with a, with a load. And that's it, because this will prepare the athlete to, one, feel more secure and two, to warm up before the match. So that's important. So we need to get them used to it. They have You have to get them used to it first and then they can implement this little by little. Three days ago, we finished the tournament here in Guadalajara. And athletes, before starting their match, they did, did these to prepare to the match. They did, did these uh, squats with uh, additional loads. And they, they didn't have any problems because they were used to it. Perfect. We have some other questions, but I'm going to choose just two. Here it is. When do you work on strength resistance? What we do during one series, well, we actually also work on resistance when we work on strength, but we don't separate these from strength. What um, what do I mean? Many people say that they work on maximum strength, power, uh, strength resistance, explosive strength. But if I execute each repetition at a maximum speed possible, I'm pretty much working on all of those. That's why it the execution speed is important because if I analyze these and I see that this is decreasing, then I'm also working on resistance because I can uh, consider certain parameters, which is a uh, decrease of 20% of speed. So when an athlete 
decreases in or or when his speed lowers in 20 percent then we have to stop the exercise but when each exercise was done at the maximum power and strength and resist and we worked on rest, maximum resistance then we would be working on explosive strength that's why the execution of the movement is very important because if I execute a movement very slowly, then I won't work on power, I won't work on maximum strength, and I won't work on explosive strength. That's why the movement is extremely important. Just to finish, Alberto, I would like to thank you. We ran out of time, unfortunately, because of the speed. As you said, that's an important factor. Maybe you can give a final message to the coaches who have joined us. Yes, training has made great progress in the last few years and it's necessary to use certain technologies. I'm not uh, saying to use the most sophisticated technology, but just minimum uh, changes in order to be more objective. The sport and badminton uh, specifically needs to be more objective. So we need to leave subjectiveness from, uh, we need to leave it out from our sport. So athletes can be better, healthier, and can last longer in high performance. So I invite everyone to be more objective in their training and in terms of, uh, and Strength training would be a way to do so. And I think that in my opinion and in general, I think that this would be the most important one for athletes. Thank you very, thank you very much for sharing this important talk. And as always, it's very interesting and enriching uh, to talk with you and to discuss the topics of current badminton. Thank you, Alberto. Let's keep in touch. To our badminton family, get your smartphones ready to capture the QR code. We invite you to our next webinar entitled The Fundamental Elements of High-Level Doubles. This webinar will be held next Tuesday, March 16th at 3 p.m. Lima time. We will have the pleasure of having Professor Thibaut Pillet from France. We're also going to share the link in the chat so you can register. We encourage you to write to us and propose topics you're interested in through the chat box. Also, we invite you to check out Badminton Pan Am's YouTube channel where you can see this and other conference we have held in the past. On behalf of Badminton Pan Am, we thank you for your participation and we hope you like this session. Greetings everyone. Stay well, stay safe. See you soon.